let me uh, first pass around a beacon transmitter of a type. This actually flew on a high altitude balloon in May, and we did recover the balloon. It had another, <coughs> it had some other radio transmitters on it as well. This uh, this one right here is very similar to the one that's down in my office right now that's transmitting that we're going to listen to here momentarily. This uses a saw resonator, and this particular one is transmitting on about 434 megahertz, approximately. And uh, saw resonators are, are cheap, low cost, small. They're not real precise on frequency, but they make real dandy solutions for this sort of thing. So this one, this particular one, I think, kicks out. Uh, this one does almost 40 milliwatts of power. The one down in the office is about 10 milliwatts. So I'll let y'all see that. That's a board design. I don't remember what the date on that one is. It's a board design that, that I did in some recent months. Let me uh, just briefly turn on a radio here. And let's see if we can hear the beacon down there. It's in my office. This radio won't actually tune quite to the frequency, which is part of the problem. That's why it sounds really bad. And we've got a lot of metal in the building, which makes a lot of problems. So this is probably not going to be a very good demo in terms of directivity. Notice it gnaws out pretty bad right there. It gets noisy. It'd be better. It'd be a better demo if I had the, had it tuned right on frequency. And we'll we'll try to get that fixed before the actual clock change. But anyway, um, there's a couple of things that are important to know about this type of antenna. This is a Yagi, what's called a Yagi antenna. And this part right here is what's called the driven element. And as a very minimum, if you build an antenna, you have to have a, a driven element. So if you wanted to make just a dipole antenna, you could make it just with the driven element, a coaxial cable that ran to your radio, but there's really not much directivity to that. They have a little bit of directivity, but it's um, mostly it's a little bit of a null off of the end. But if you add what's called a reflector behind that, so assume we didn't have any of these other elements out here. We just had the driven element and a reflector, and the reflector generally is about 5% longer. The driven element will be cut properly to the wavelength to a half wavelength at the frequency you're interested in, an electrical half wavelength. And you have to keep in mind an electrical half wavelength is a little bit different from a free space wavelength due to uh, a little bit of difference in the speed to the velocity of the signals. So a reflector, you can put a reflector behind it, and if you just had these two elements here, you wind up getting about 3 dB gain above and beyond what you get with just the driven element by itself. So that makes your directivity about twice as good. If you just had this element by itself, it's somewhat omnidirectional. If you looked at it in a vertical plane like this, let's say you had vertical polarization, which is what I've got right now, this would have fairly uniform grain, gain around the circle. Then if we put a reflector here, it tends to block the signal this direction and tends to give us a little bit more gain this direction. The signal that are off this direction will come in a little bit stronger, about twice as strong. And then to get 3 dB more of gain, which is twice as much again, we have to have a total of four elements. So these out here are called directors. And these generally are about 5% shorter than the one cut specifically to your frequency. There's some uh, information I'm going to hand out here in a few moments that gives you a little bit more information on cutting these elements and spacing and so forth. The spacing right here, this is a this is sort of a seat of the pants antenna, not particularly engineered very well, and performance is not all that great on this one. But it was something I threw together last spring. I threw together three of these so that we'd have some for the fox hunt. This is a quarter wavelength if you're just doing a seat of the pants antenna. This is a quarter wavelength. These are all spaced a quarter wavelength at 434 megahertz. 
So in this case, I'm making each director a little bit shorter as we go this direction. So if this is our reference, we put a director that gives us 3 dB, twice the gain. Two more, I mean, a reflector here. Driven, reflector. Two more here. Now we've got about a 6 dB gain antenna, in theory. To get it to 9 dB, which doubles the gain again, we have to put one, two, three, four more. And to double the gain again, we have to again double the number of elements. So you can see that basically to make this has got about a five foot long boom on it. So to double the gain of this one, we have to make it essentially twice as long as it is now. Polarization. So the uh, I don't know if this will demonstration will work or not. We'll see. Again, being in the building makes a lot of problems because there's a lot of metal conductors here. So this demo is not going to go well. Sorry about that. <clears throat> you have to realize that there's a basically a steel structure in here that makes it makes an electrical cage. And so it makes this demo almost worthless inside the building. But if we were outside in the field. It depends on, like the balloon flights, typically we have the antenna hanging vertically from the payload. So this is fairly flexible kind of antenna in that regard that since it's not glued. So if you're trying to find a balloon up there, you can take it and get this clear of your body, try to get this clear of any objects like this. And then this way we have vertical polarization, which works well on the balloons. I haven't decided what we'll do on the polarization for the box hunt, but we could go with vertical. That's easy enough to do. Uh, this particular one, you can change the polarization on it real easy by twisting. And this now becomes horizontally polarized. <clears throat> this one's pretty beat up. It's been thrown around in the back of my Jeep for a long time. But it's a nice portable antenna. I'll take it apart. And, uh, so I don't have my good antennas with me, but I want to show you a couple other ways you can make them. There's no reason you have to use PVC. You can use a piece of wood. And the antenna designs that Kent Britton has got in there, he uses a wood boom for his stuff. And uh, <clears throat> this is one I threw together real rapidly once upon a time, uh, years ago. And it's been thrown around in my Jeep for a long time. And I just it happened to be in there, so I thought, well, I'll bring it in and uh, show you all that. This is my preferred method to build antennas. I don't have one of these to show you because... I've built three of these, and they're all mounted on towers right now in service. But this is a piece of half-inch copper pipe, copper plumbing pipe. And what I've done is I've put a dowel rod down the middle to give it a little bit more strength. And then I drill the holes on a drill press. This is, uh, it's either number eight or number six ground wire that you can buy in 25-foot rolls. It's a little bit pricey. But you can get it at places like Sutherland's or Lowe's or Home Depot. And uh, <clears throat> so I make my elements out of this copper wire, and then I use a propane torch and solder and solder these in place. And these make really nice, good outdoor permanent type antennas. So you all are welcome to come up and look at these a little later, but... What I've done to hold these elements in place, this is just copper wire, number 12 house wiring. And what I've done to hold these in place is put a little bead of solder, once I drill the hole with the drill press, I put a little bead of solder on each side of this wire, and that keeps it from moving. These can be uh, held in place with screws. As far as how you hook up the coax to the driven element, there's all kinds of ways to do that. And, uh, Look in some book like the AWRL handbook. It's got some good coverage on that. The uh, real simple way that I'm using here is sort of a J interface that a friend of mine, Kent Britton, WA5BJB, down in the uh, Dallas area, he came up with this. I'm going to pass these around. Those of you that want them, I know there's a couple of people that wanted them, and not everybody was that interested in it, but... Uh, Anyway, he's got, uh, he uses Kent, the guy that designed uh, that particular feed. If you look there on the second page of that, 
he uses basically a J element and he takes a piece of wire you can maybe kind of see it on this one where it's a piece of wire that's about one and a half times the half wavelength and we bend it it makes sort of a J shape and then the uh, coax is fed here in the middle and it makes pretty close to a 50 ohm match when you do that. It's close enough to work reasonably well for these type of antennas. There's a lot of other ways you can do the match. If you do a folded dipole, you wind up getting about 300 ohms, and then in that case you need a, a ballon that will transform. It's not only a, um, balanced to unbalanced, but also does an impedance transformation from the 300 ohms to about 50 ohms, or close. And uh, there's also gamma matches, and there's, gosh, I, there's there's half a dozen ways to match into the driven elements. And so, if you're going to design one of these antennas, I just encourage you to go do a little research into it. The AWRL handbook is a really good resource, and uh, several people, like in Project Three, I know have that book. You can uh, get access to that. The library probably has some editions over the years and most editions every edition that I've ever had my hands on covers some good stuff on antennas. I'm going to show you how to do these Yagi antennas. Yagi antennas is not the only way to go but they perform pretty well and uh, let me talk a little bit about some characteristics that are involved in the contest. So let's say we were using this antenna here for our discussion. We're going to look at more than just the uh, network analyzer. Network analyzer tells us some good stuff. It tells us the uh, return loss on the antenna, which tells you how well it's tuned to the frequency and so forth. But it's also our plan to set up a source, a signal source, out of what we call a far field distance, which is quite a few wavelengths away from the antenna. And so things we'll be interested in is the forward gain. So if the source is over there and you have your antenna aimed at it, how much gain does your antenna have compared to simply a reference dipole antenna? We're also interested in front to back ratio. If you turn your antenna exactly backwards to the source, how good does it reject that signal compared to how well it has gain on that signal here. That's actually an important consideration when you're trying to find a downed payload or a fox in the case of our fox hunt because if your antenna has almost the same gain both directions which way do you look? Right. So in that case you have to do triangulation. Uh, are we going to have an ugliest antenna? No. Most over engineered? This would certainly count as ugliest, or this one. I, don't, I think it'd be hard pressed anybody to make anything uglier than either one of these. There's even a design that uses two dipoles mounted apart. Two dipoles mounted apart, where there's uh, switching diodes that, where you switch one antenna on and off. You use a 555 timer to switch one antenna on, the other one off, and it you wind up getting a phase relationship between the signals. And uh, I don't know really all the details on those. Paulus built one of those years ago, and he thought they were pretty slick. I don't think they have as good a performance as a really good long Yagi, but they still do give some directivity. All right, I guess that's all I've got. Short and sweet. Okay.